So the first talk is going to be an uh, introduction to imaging science by Professor Lars Gerdman. And um, we're going to take a look. All right. So we uh, start off by wishing you all a, a good morning on the beginning of, um, of the second day. And it's a real privilege to be here to, um, to give you a, um, a little bit of an overview, a, a high-level talk on, um, on the concept of um, image science. So um, I'm going to start off, uh, and sort of this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to give you a little bit of a motivation of the study for, of image science and explain what image science is and what it isn't. Um, and it always pays to know um, a little bit about the origins. And in many ways, you've seen in some of the preliminary talks you've, you saw yesterday, you've, you've seen something about the origin of image science because obviously it all begins with the human eye and the formation of an image on a retina. Um, and we relate uh, to images in a, in a very profound way. It's kind of, uh, you know, um, um, a, a good image can convey, as I said, a thousand words or, or more of, of information. It's a very effective way um, for humans to, um, to learn about things around them is through imaging systems. Um, a lot of our brain is uh, is dedicated, obviously, to the processing of images and extraction of information from them, and that's the beginning of what image science is about. Um, I will tell you a little bit about, about image science. It's not a term you hear bandied about that often in the media, um, but there is, in fact, a, um, a formal uh, field of image science. There are journals dedicated um, to publications in image science societies, um, meetings, um, and programs, and there aren't that many programs. In fact, the, the activities at the College of Optical Sciences are probably um, right together with um, one of the East Coast programs that I won't name as one of the few areas um, um, that really goes into depth um, in optical, in the image science as, as, as integrated with optical sciences. So I'll talk a little bit about images and imaging systems, and I will put up a little bit of a taxonomy that we can um, use to, to sort of um, analyze imaging systems <laughs> what kinds of effects are they measuring? What are they doing? Um, it's nice to have formal ways of uh, putting things into category. As, a, as, a, as, a, as an old joke goes, there was a wag once says, there are two types of people in this world, uh, those who like to divide people into groups and those who don't. <laughs> Think about that one. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about some examples from modern imaging, synthetic aperture radar, scanning electron microscopy, astronomy, and near and dear to my own heart, the uh, medical imaging modalities of CT, MRI, PET, and SPECT. And we're in the midst of um, revolutions in terms of the capabilities of imaging systems. We'll discuss a little bit about why that is occurring. And in the end, it's um, image science has the word science in it. And so the, you can ask the question, is there a science of imaging? Is, is the creation of images a scientific process? Well, in and of itself, the answer to that is no. So we'll go back and look at the formal definitions of what it means for something to be a science. And we will show you that image science, in fact, is much more than about the creation and looking at images. That in and of itself would not constitute a scientific method. And the scientific method is critically important in all fields. Um, and going back and reminding yourself about what it takes to be pursuing a scientific process um, is very, very critical. And this is extremely important in um, the medical imaging field. So um, historians will always, uh, are, you know, history as a, as a research field uh, um, consists of uh, disagreeing about who originated things. <laughs> uh, that in many ways is sort of the definition. I mean, re re uh, going back, someone can always uh, find somebody who did something earlier that suggests that they knew it first. So we're not, I'm just going to pick an arbitrary point, and it goes back a long way. Um, it uh, um, came out of, the, um, out of a Egypt, and uh, a scientist named Abu Ali Hassan Ibn al-Haytham, a complicated name, so the Western term for him is just al Hazan is the name given to him. So he is credited in, in, by many historians, uh, 
as really the um, the first person who um, who um, formulated a a modern version of the scientific method and and by that I mean that he's the first person that combined the ideas and it happened to be he was interested in optics and that was his primary area but who caught, who started to formulate the ideas of an experimental science the systematic variation of parameters in an experiment and he was doing this to try to understand the phenomena of, of refraction and reflection and image formation in the eye and trying to explain the process by which an object could apparently create an image in the brain. It wasn't really understood at his time that it was an inverted image formed on the retina. And, and as a side note, I will tell you that uh, scientists fought against the idea, early scientists, of an inverted image on the retina for a long time because it seemed completely upside down um, for nature to work that way. So uh, Alhazen combined inquisitive mind uh, a very uh, an, an extremely um, methodical approach to his work, um, together with um, a really excellent, outstanding um, um, skills in geometry and mathematics. And in many ways, if we're going to talk about, you, you know, if you're contemplating a career in in one of the sciences or something, um, those three those three um, pieces are the, are the critical elements. Now, Alhazen um, didn't start from scratch. He built on um, um, ideas of Ptolemy. So I'm going back to the Greeks and um, going back even further than that and some other cultures. Um, but he's the first guy who sort of assimilated the pieces and started to think about things in a systematic way. He, um, he, did, he did study um, history of himself, so he knew about Ptolemy, and he had read about Ptolemy's work. And he also looked at contributions from um, ancient Chinese cultures. Um, and the camera obscura, basically the pinhole imaging system, is actually traced by most scientific historians back now into ancient China, uh, going long, long, long back. And it was now, it came from China as credit of being brought into um, the um, intellectual centers in, in, in Cairo and Alexandria in Egypt, um, before then coming up and, and becoming an important part of um, imaging systems in the Renaissance in, in Europe in the 1400s. And so there were already um, demonstrations in, in, in Egypt at the time, about 1000 AD, um, in which pinhole projection systems were being used for entertainment purposes, basically, and to look at these interesting optical principles and how they work. Um, and that's really um, a, a piece of the puzzle of, it, you can't really call it a camera in a sense, of course, that it had no ability to record the final image, but it's a camera in the sense of projecting an image of a three-dimensional world onto a two-dimensional image plane. And, um, and um, for the purpose, again, of, of uh, primarily, for, I think, for um, raising interesting in systems, but also you making use of the fact that humans are so tied to images of the real world. Alhausen um, was interested in all pieces of the puzzle. <coughs> and he understood and worked out that the um, that, the, the, of course, the eye was the essential element. Easy experiment proves that. Close your eyes, image gone. Open your eyes, image is back. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Little experiments like that, piece by piece, is what starts to build a coherent picture of how the human visual system works. Um, he produced a seven-volume book of uh, optics in uh, the year 1021, which is, uh, to us seems like a really long time ago. Um, and in 2015, the SPIE um, year was celebrated as the year of photonics, uh, or the year of light, International Year of Light, I think was the official name given to it. Um, it was also credited as being the 1,000 year anniversary of the publication of Alhausen's book on, on optics, 1015 to 2015. Pretty remarkable um, things. Um, the understanding of the fact that the, um, that, the, that the visual system, the eyes, are sensors that feed signals into a fabulous processing network that is um, in the brain dates to um, studies in, in uh, systematic studies in anatomy of the brain um, that started in the Renaissance periods and, and the, tr the flow of information um, through the optical nervous system is that that description dates to Andreas Vesalius in 1543. Um, and as early as, um, you know, by 1918, you know, hundreds of years later, um, the, f the information flow was, um, was very nicely understood, um, including this odd fact in, um, 
in the, that, the, um, that, this, that the signals from the left and the right eye, in fact, uh, cross in the brain and are processed for reasons that are I'm not aware of, but they have probably been explained. The signal pathways pass down the opposite brain from the side where the um, information was collected on. And indeed, a deficit on the right hand, an injury to the right-hand side of the brain will cause a deficit in the left visual field, which is an odd, um, a little bit of an odd phenomenon. Um, image science in, is, um, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a piece of the, of the field of optics, of course, um, to get a grip on, um, on the method by which images are formed, you need to understand the flow of light through systems. And so the, the really the founders of, uh, of optics are also the, the, all of the key founders in the field of image science. And of course, it's, um, it dates back to um, the ray theory or corpuscular theory of light and the, and the study of the fundamental means by which the paths of light can be bent, reflections, refractions, Diffraction. How many methods are there to, to change the direction by which light um, passes through a, a media or through a pathway? There's a bunch of them, right? There's the usual ones we think about. I once, I once tried to make a list. I put it in a list in a chapter on how to design medical imaging systems. And I put in a little joke, uh, which I learned is a bad idea in a scientific uh, <laughs> publication. because. I made a little comment about how um, uh, gravitational lensing was hard to pull off in the, in the laboratory setting. <laughs> and somebody edited it down the stream. And what I had written, it as I thought, was a very clever little sort of joke for the reader. It was edited into something that just looked like a stupid statement. Uh, <laughs> I, hate, I even hate the sight of that book in my... Uh, in my bookcase. Be wary when somebody has a chance downstream of you to change your language, because a change of word here and there changes meaning from, certainly it can change scientific meanings, it can certainly change intent, whether it's to be funny, to, um, to be apparently not completely with it. <laughs> Isaac Newton, Newtonian telescope. Ray theory, crepuscular theory, transport of energy through systems. Um, you know, the real, um, in many ways, the real um, pioneer in, in um, uh, that com started to combine all of the pieces um, in the late Renaissance and post-Renaissance era is, is really Galilei, driven by his interest in astronomy. Um, he, in many ways, um, points out something. That he, he is truly, uh, genuinely, um, can be considered a physicist, mathematician, engineer, astronomer, and philosopher. Um, it's a picture that, um, that you will, and you heard... Um, a quick description of yesterday that um, to be to be effective as a scientist in many ways a graduate education focuses your uh, your attention on on more and more precise problems <laughs> but in fact the solution to problems often comes from a very broad um, background in training and no one really no one really knows where a truly novel and inspired and new advancing uh, idea how that emerges in your brain um, I personally happen to think it might well be inspired by a piece of literature you read where the, you somehow make connections that makes you take a step that no one has taken before. Um, it is not enough to be one-dimensional um, on a problem. Problem solving means drawing from experiences across a wide range. So one of the things I encourage you to do in your, as you're approaching the end of your undergraduate career is take the opportunities to think about taking some electives that you have room for that might have been outside your normal sphere of thinking because you never know when some little tidbit in one field comes back to be a contributor in a problem you're working on in another one. So. Now, the story of optics is not told completely with um, a ray or a, a, um, or a Kaposko theory of light alone. You need the wave properties. And so we have to trace, um, to get to calculate and to be able to predict what images are going to look like completely right, you need to be able to understand um, really the, the, um, the interferometry or interferometric and wave properties of light as it passes through optical systems. And for that, we have to credit really Huygens, Fresnel, and, and Fraunhofer as the, as the key founders of, um, that has built the modern um, physical optics theory. So they're laying it as well. So this is, uh, oh, and, and talk about, uh, talk about um, uh, an interesting coincidence. Two of the key players in the, in the, in the foundation of Fourier optics, and indeed in foundations of mathematics at this point, physics and optics, 
um, were Renaissance men of their own. Um, that's Thomas Young and Joseph Fourier, of course. Fourier theory you're all aware of and being exposed to. Uh, Thomas Young, famous experiments with interferometry. Um, both of them were also simultaneously chewing on the problem of trying to decode uh, hieroglyphics. And in fact, they more or less uh, simultaneously made the breakthroughs that allowed the ancient Egyptian um, uh, symbolic language of uh, hieroglyphics to be decoded. It was a, a, a fundamentally a, you know that the Rosetta Stone was a key piece, but it was also a, a problem of logical thinking and um, in essentially cryptology and the science of how to decrypt and encoded messages that was a key piece of the puzzle. Skills in science, skills in mathematics can translate into um, a lot of interesting places in your life. Um, medical imaging um, in many ways traces its roots to um, the experiments from uh, Rankin. And Rankin is an interesting story that we tell in the, in the medical imaging uh, coursework in this college. Um, so the discovery of the of the ability of X-rays to um, uh, to penetrate tissue and and record an image in an op in an emulsion or in a film that you developed was an accidental discovery. The, uh, I won't tell all the aspects of the story, um, but it's an interesting story in in uh, in how times have changed. So the discovery occurred um, of the discovery of the X-ray and the ability to create an image on a film. Uh, it took about two months from that until the first medical application of X-ray imaging was in place. There's a there's a, a child with a broken bone was imaged for the purpose of figuring out seeing the break and figuring out how to set the bone properly. And it was literally a couple of years later, of course, uh, coincident with the founding of the, the Nobel Prize that Rankin was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics in in um, in 1901. Interesting if you look at him, not well known, mechanical engineer, agriculture and physics. Again, keep, the, keep it in mind to step outside your, uh, your areas of, of study to pick up additional exposure to things. Um, the history of image science takes, um, uh, takes a, a little while to develop and um, the modern uh, the, um, ideas about image science actually draw their, um, their inspiration from a book produced by Dainty and Shaw, Principles of Image Science, published in 1974. And they are, that was primarily about um, uh, photographic imaging of the sky. They, were, uh, they were, um, remain or and, and remain active researchers, uh, just about retirement age now. Um, so Chris Dainty and Rod Shaw were, have been visitors um, um, to visit this institution over the years, produced this book called the um, basically titled Image Science. And it has this key component of in the title, in the subtitle, Principles, Analysis, and Evaluation. And sort of, these are the three, three of the key um, aspects of turning something into a science. You need an understanding of the foundational principles. You need an analytic approach, quantitative ideally. And evaluation means you must have a quantitative assessment of, a, of success. You must have some way of measuring um, the, the um, <coughs> As opposed to subjective, I like this image better than that one. We need to get an evaluation process in that's by nature quantitative. So uh, after the mid-1970s, it was uh, things started to happen in terms of um, organizing a field. Uh, first university department, I said I wouldn't mention it, but there's the Center for Imaging Science. Uh, it was opened up on the East Coast. Uh, the Journal of the Optical Society of America added image science to its title for JOSA A. Um, courses in image science started, were added in the 1980s to the graduate curriculum here at the Optical Sciences Center, as it was known then, before it was a college in the 1980s. Um, and new societies in the 1990s started to spring up, dedicated to um, uh, biomedical imaging, medical imaging, um, astronomical imaging, you name it. It was a, a bright period. Um, a key aspect of um, image science was in 2001, the NIH recognized the importance of a science of imaging uh, was going to be important moving forward uh, in, the, um, in the human health field, enough so that they formed a National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering in order to um, run intramural and extramural grant programs that fund um, imaging efforts in, um, that will be important to human health. And now there's, um, since, the, since the 2000s, a number of other university programs in image science have been formed. Um, in 2006, we sort of formalized things in a PhD track in image science, and it's right, right now it's a, um, 
the graduate curriculum here at the Optical Sciences um, program is very much an, um, capable of individual um, um, creation. Really, graduate students work together with their advisor to build a plan of study that fulfills um, particular areas. If you work in image science, there are a number of courses that are recommended um, that sort of lay the foundation. That's about 20 courses related to imaging and image science, and I won't spend too much. This is some introduction to what's in the, um, in the curriculum and in the research programs here. Um, there is a, um, a full set of courses that build the imaging, build your knowledge of Im imaging principles and the mathematics behind them. Um, there's about 25 faculty, not only in this department, we have um, joint appointments in this department, et cetera, that do research in imaging. So there's lots of um, opportunities for graduate research um, and making contributions to imaging in not only biomedical applications, but also in, um, in, um, in environmental, atmospheric, and <coughs> remote sensing, and you'll, you'll hear about many of those, so I will not say that much about them. Um, this is kind of a list of the courses that are taught. Some of the, you will recognize some of the people who have gave you presentations yesterday on this list. So this is kind of a picture of the, um, what the coursework looks like. And all classes are given every year. Some of them go to every other year or so, depending upon the demand from the student body. Um, but it's a pretty comprehensive program that, um, that you, where you can learn um, just about everything that you would want to know about image science. Um, the, the, ac the intellectual and the um, academic program here in the, in the College of Optical Sciences very much builds on a book that came out in 2004 written by one of the um, a regents professor here in the department, Professor Harry Barrett, together with one of his um, former graduate students, PhD graduate, Kyle Myers. Um, Kyle has gone on to a career. She is now the um, director of the Center for Radiological Health at the FDA. It's the organization that is responsible for evaluating um, new medical imaging systems as they're brought on board or um, want to be brought on board by, um, by companies. You've created a new X-ray CT machine. You've created a new MRI machine. You want to be able to say, creates better images than I've ever seen before. You have to prove that to the FDA. You have to prove that with, with image science principles, statistics. You have to prove it with um, very expensive um, clinical studies. Um, but now the FDA has reached an interesting point where they say, if you understand the imaging principles and you understand the statistics of an imaging process, you can, in fact, do a virtual clinical trial, a simulation in which you create a virtual population of patients, process them through an accurate model of your system, do a few comparisons between what your system is producing and what the simulation says your system is producing. If you get into good match, you can in fact avoid the multi-billion dollar cost of clinical trials, essentially, especially if your system achieves something called substantial equivalence, which means it builds off existing technology and takes it an incremental step. Um, and it's a key piece of the puzzle. Many, many graduate students have followed Carl Myers into the FDA, and I would, the University of Arizona's um, optical sciences program is, is, has been populating the people with the right training in image science to um, fulfill that regulatory function for the, for the nation. So let's, uh, let's start talking a little bit about, um, um, about all the different ways that you can form images, um, which is not, also, not only about uh, what what kinds of principles are involved in forming the image, but exactly what it is that you're imaging. And so it can start with a taxonomy about, um, and you saw light in quotes yesterday. That is because light um, comes in many different forms. Of course, you know that about the, um, we have the electromagnetic spectrum that ranges everywhere from down in radio wave domain <coughs> um, and even um, there's, there's not, there are more classifications inside here, but this basically walks through the domain from long wavelengths to short, short wavelengths going off into um, soft x-rays, hard x-rays. They're written over here as particles, but that's a little bit of a misnomer. They're also electromagnetic waves. Um, why do you think they're placed over here in particles? I'll just open up and ask the question, as opposed to over here in, they are electromagnetic waves. <laughs> Anybody have any idea why you, why you wouldn't why I want to shift them over here and call them particles instead? It's actually it's a dangerous uh, um, it's a dangerous thing to say, right? Because people will misunderstand. Yes. They carry enough momentum. They see a lot of Compton scatter. They um, they will uh, photons will Compton scatter. 
Uh, basically, what's happened is the wavelengths get so short relative to the dimensions that of uh, distances between things that we encounter in the physical world that the properties of wave properties of light, diffraction, etc., uh, are really insignificant because the wavelengths are short compared to everything that they see, and so you can you can you can ignore. So it's really the domains where you have to worry about diffraction. I would rather put them back over here. I didn't make this figure. I would I, maybe I'd want to have a little line over here that connects them. Certainly, they're EM waves. Um, Particles also leave something off. It should have had electrons on here also. Anyway, image science encompasses Im um, the formation of images via straight electromagnetic radiation, uh, via particles that propagate through systems that have exact analogies to um, optical systems that have exact analogies to what we use for, um, for changing the directions of visible light. We use diffraction and physical optics phenomena will describe the propagation of seismic waves, water waves, ultrasound. And then you have a variety of um, imaging systems that you can, you can try to make use of things that are quasi-static, which means the fields are not propagating. You have to bring the sensor in close to them to detect them. You cannot have the sensor far away and wait for the light. That's a little bit less optics, but it's still you can form images that way. Um, now, the question is, when you're forming an image of an object, um, when we talk about the human eye forming, uh, going outside and, and forming an image of, of a scene in front of you, of course, we're talking about optical reflectance. I don't think human vision is in here. Well, the problem with human vision is there's no way to get, at, as yet, to get the electrical signals uh, out of the eye. Um, they get processed. They stay inside the brain. So the image science has to do with those things that we can record with. Um, and that's not exactly true. But to a large extent, they have to do with those things that we can record um, with and, and get an electronic signal of some kind that we can digitize in, nowadays and start working with. Um, so you can see we can work with um, reflectance and we can image the reflective properties of surfaces and materials. Um, we can measure um, source strengths if we're imaging a star uh, up in the sky. Certainly the magnitude of the star is a function not only how, f how far away it is but also of the, of, the, of the brightness of the original stellar source. Sometimes we measure when the signal comes from something that's a contrast agent. We're measuring the concentration of that contrast agent. Sometimes we're worried about wave amplitudes. How big was that earthquake? Sometimes we're worried about the attenuation of light or, or particles moving through. For example, the transmission x-ray system. You go in and get it. It's really the, the, um, the attenuative properties of the body to that energy range of x-rays chosen so that there is a significant attenuation, not too much and not too little. That is the physical principle. Um, index of refraction, phase contrast microscope, scattering properties, medical ultrasound, weather radar, optical coherence tomography should be in here. Um, field strength, mm, electric magnetic properties, MRI scan that you look at. Um, mo the, the, if you go in for an MRI scan right now and get an image, in fact, it's a little bit of a misnomer to, you have to really say, I went in for an MRI study because they will typically do about seven different um, so-called sequences where they measure different properties and sometimes the most useful ones are the rates of spin relaxation as opposed to what it normally measures which is the concentration just simply the concentration of water that's present the uh, protons in the water give rise to the um, the MRI signal um, you can measure surface heights laser ranging radar arranging etc we can make another set by the, um, by the imaging um, principle that's involved. So the, physical, the previous one was about the physical property. Here is what it is that is actually giving rise, the effect that's being used to give rise to the, um, to the image. We'll, t we'll spend a little bit of time talking about synthetic aperture radar, and synthetic apertures in particular as one of the, um, as one of the examples that I'll show you. We'll talk about X-ray computer tomography and imaging of gamma rays from the medical imaging. And I think I, the other, we'll talk about um, um, interferometry for and, and in um, reflective telescopes for the um, example in astronomy. Um, we can talk about what the, um, the direction and the nature of the acquisition that occurs. So direct imaging will be, um, will be something where we probe, we apply an imager. We're actually, we're actually interacting, doing something to get close. And we may do it in a, in a serial acquisition, means that you measure one point at a time and you have a rastering process in order to, um, to build up a two-dimensional two image, for example. And we'd call that a serial acquisition. 
direct imaging by the human eye, parallel acquisition. You, we are in, acquiring, on the retina, we get projected the entire image at once, and we're, pro, we're um, the, the sensors in the eye are producing, in parallel, are all producing measurements of the, of the relative intensity, and if it's color in the, in the different regions of the spectrum. And it's all occurring at the same time, so we don't have a, luckily, we have more than one light sensor moving around uh, in the eye. That would be a very slow and frustrating part of the process. The indirect measurements here refer to the fact, so these, are dir these directly form images. The indirect method means we have to make a set of measurements, and then we do have to do processing on them in order to recover the actual image. Um, in other words, what the raw data coming out of the system cannot be viewed as an image and understood in any way sense of the form, and that's really where these um, other techniques are involved. Passive versus active systems, yet another way to make a description. Passive systems, again, sit and um, wait for a signal going to image a star. All we do is build a camera, um, aim it in the right direction, keep it stable, and wait for the light to arrive. Active systems, we're actually, we're actually pinging the system, probing the system, apply, putting energy in and looking at the, um, the response back. Um, the most interesting one, of course, the imaging, subsurface imaging, which begins with setting off an explosive and waiting for the compressive waves to propagate down through the surface and come back up and tell us about the distribution of cavities and deposits and and what else is below the ground um, represents the most active of um, stimulating systems. Let's talk a little bit about synthetic aperture. So um, synthetic aperture radar is something that's been around for a little while that um, is a radar system where you, that's flown on it with a source and a detector that's on an airplane. Uh, can fly very fast, can fly high. Um, and you know that from your, from your in investigations into optics so far that the resolution of an image is in many ways defined by the size of the aperture that's used to create the image, right? The resolution formulas that tell you the size of the point spread function depend on the, on the, on the size of the aperture, as well as the aberrations that occur if there are imperfections in the system. Um, but there are many cases where um, you would, it's impractical to put an ex exceptionally large aperture, a single aperture up. And so a modern trend is to say, well, okay, maybe we can collect the signals, uh, not all at once with one giant aperture, but let, maybe we can do a stimulus and a measurement where we basically fly along as if we were thinking about ourselves as a, a little sensor that flies along the surface of, 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 uh, of, an, of a lens, <laughs> but there is no lens. We're just going to measure what's there, and then we're going to synthesize what an, what an imaging system with um, that aperture would have had. And synthetic aperture radar is a um, is a um, technique used that can achieve some remarkable um, things. Works down in the in a radar in the microwave uh, reflection range. Um, you can fly very very high. It's obviously interest of interest for um, military purposes, for surveillance, and figuring out what's going on on um, um, on, on sites of interest that you want to be able to monitor. Um, and it's very much a, a technique in which no data point at any single point conveys any information at all. It's the assembly of a, um, of a set of interferometric, interferometric measurements as you pass through a path that are heavily processed by computers to put together then um, extremely fine resolution um, imagery from, again, very, very high altitudes. It has a, um, it has a role in, um, in, um, in environmental measuring methods, and you'll see applications. Um, there can be satellite-borne um, systems that uh, image, that produce images um, of, of heights, for example. And anybody have a guess at, at what we're looking down at here? Um, Straits of Gibraltar, good guess. <laughs> uh, anybody realize what we're seeing in the image? Pretty interesting. Diffract, you know, so the diffraction created by the opening in the Straits of Gibraltar is measured by an Earth uh, satellite. Yeah, you can see the the uh, wave front emerging from the aperture in the yeah, pretty remarkable the scales over which diffract wave theory uh, is able to predict. Uh, you know, this is now thousands of kilometers on a well, certainly hundreds of kilometers on the scale that we're looking at um, across the image here. Um, has a lot of, for satellite, it has a lot of mod applications that are going to be of critical importance to humans in the future. This is, you can do some interesting things if you use, make use of the spectral properties 
um, then you can build pictures in a um, in a um, of the particular plants that are present in a domain. You can look for long term changes as a re result. I'm not going to um, um, not going to get into and even pretend it's a debate of any kind, but we anticipate that there will be changes in the nature of the uh, distribution of plants that are present in different parts of the country and different parts of, um, of the planet. <laughs> Spectral information, making use of the color properties, um, can give you spectacular um, additional dimension to data, allowing you to identify predominant tree species, obviously, in this particular um, example. So if we go through our uh, taxonomy and look at synthetic aperture radar, it's, using, uh, it's imaging with electromagnetic waves in the w wavelength range in the 1 to 3 centimeter range. The pro physical property measured, microwave reflectance, surface height. The imaging mechanism is um, interferometry, so it's a microwave analog of holography. It's indirect imaging. It requires digital optical reconstruction, so lots of computer processing afterwards to build the final images. Um, and it's an active imaging technique in the way that we have probed the scene with a microwave beam, waited for the reflected signal, and, um, and um, so that's, that's where our taxonomy fits for SAR. Here are some remarkable properties of synthetic aperture radar. The resolution is independent of the wavelength. That never happens in optical systems usually. It's independent of the distance to, from the imaging system to the object. This means that you can put, um, you can put, you can do synthetic aperture radar with, with, um, with a satellite, with a plane, high-flying plane, low-flying plane. You can do it wherever you want to. Um, it also turns out to be independent of the speed of the source. You can do it on a fast jet. You can do it on a rocket if you want to. And, of course, the speed across the ground of a, um, of a satellite is, um, is very, very high. Let's look at another imaging system, scanning electron microscopy. I'm going to go quick here because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. But scanning electron microscopy is, is making use of what? It's, uh, well, scanning electrons. It's making use of a beam of electrons. Um, the electrons in a modern uh, scanning electron microscopy systems go through an optical system. It's electron optics. But you have exactly, you can create with electromagnetic fields, you can create the equivalent of positive and negative lenses. You can take a diverging beam of electrons, steer them back together. You talk about focal lengths. You have a complete theory um, that maps very nicely to the optical theory. The signal that comes off is usually secondary electrons that come off the sample. You're able to focus and control the depth of focus by the um, use of the, of the electron steering optics. You have the ability to laterally scan in X, Y. You have everything you need to form um, to form um, beautiful images. And the example I give you here, here, these are all electron microscopy images of the same mosquito going through um, the inherent zoom that's possible with a scanning electron microscope. So we start with a picture of an entire mosquito head. <coughs> zoom in, um, but not quite a factor 10, um, <coughs> in order to be able to see details of the eye can zoom further in on individual cells, can get down and look finally at uh, magnifications up to 35,000. So, so one of the things about electron microscopy um, that it addresses very neatly is as you go in magnifications that are a factor 1,000 different between is one of the modern uh, challenges of, um, of, um, in imaging is the question about length scales. We would like to be able to say, take the human brain. If you want to figure out how the human brain works, you need to be able to see interconnections at the scale of neurons and axons. Very, very small, finest microscopies. But if you're down at that scale, you're going to miss the big picture, which is this large interconnected organ system. You need this whole thing. Think about, think about an alien um, uh, who somehow gets here and wants to figure out what a computer is and how it works. Now, if they can get here, they probably got it figured out. But let's say they didn't. <laughs> let's say they didn't. And you want to figure out how a computer works from, with a set of imaging experiments, transmission, x-ray, whatever. So you start out, you look, you see, at first, what do you, you, see a, you see a box, you look inside. What do you see at length scales on the order of millimeters? You see some chips. You see a lot of, um, you see a lot of copper traces on a board. And, um, but you don't see the transistors that are doing the actual job, right? But on the other hand, as you start digging down further, if you start looking at individual transistors, you're seeing too fine. You don't see a computer as an integrated mechanism that's taking running a program, for example. That you'll miss completely. 
Um, you will see only electrical signals. You will not see the build the assembly of a set of electrons into a multiplier, for example. You will miss that pit. So you need the whole set of length scales. And this is a big challenge right now in image science is um, considering and building systems that are able to really do essentially what this electron microscopy system does. And this is this goes from fine resolution to exceptionally fine resolution. We need to be able to back out a little further and still deal with the the ability to see the big growth structures and, and zoom further and further and further in to get the whole thing. Along the way, you can learn things like how Velcro works. How many people have seen this picture before? Everybody knew how Velcro worked. It's still cool to see it, right? It's remarkable to see the little, the little bands actually hooked around the little hooks. I think it's um, pretty cool. Scanning electron microscopy, imaging with charged particles, wavelengths on the order of a tenth of a nanometer. That's the big advantage with uh, working with particles as opposed to electromagnetic waves directly. The de Broglie wavelength, because of the mass of the particle, is very short compared to for the given the energy of the um, um, property being measured. Secondary electron emission, often. Um, that's the source of the signal. Imaging mechanism is really by diffraction. The electron beam is steered and focused by the electric field. That's what allows us to create a point-by-point -point response into the detector system that we can raster and build the image. It's direct imaging. There's a scanning beam. No reconstruction is required, but it is active imaging. It's illuminated by the electron beam. If you, if you just took the sample and put it underneath and didn't turn on the, um, the electron beam, you wouldn't see anything. So it does require active probing. Unlike astronomical imaging, the lights are sources are already out there, and all we have to do is be clever about what we do with the signals when they arrive here on Earth. Um, the U of A is very much involved with a, um, the development of the detector systems for um, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. How many of you have heard about this one? This is going to be this um, um, amazing, um, how many is 32 gigapixel? Three gigapixels. I don't even think that's enough. It's uh, some massive uh, CCD assembly of CCD cameras to build one integrated sensor, developing so much data per night uh, that, as I understand, the plan is to open up the um, the data stream to the public. You can write your own codes to sit and and, um, and sort through an area of the sky, uh, looking for you know looking for killer asteroids out there. You can look for supernova that have gone off. You can do. It's going to be an interesting time period when they, um, when they essentially bring the um, power of an inquisitive public to bear on the question of how to find interesting stuff going on out in space. Uh, Large binocular telescope is out on Mount, um, Mount, 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 Mount Graham, uh, about 60 miles, um, 45 miles um, due east um, of the city of Tucson out in the um, Pinolino Mountains. Um, adaptive optics is an area of great, and, I, and you will hear more about adaptive optics. I think I'll skip this quickly. I will just say a little bit about the adaptive optics have been developed for astronomy to get around the, um, the distortion in the wave front that occurs as light passes through the turbulent uh, um, media up in the upper atmosphere that have these turbulent cells on the order of dimensions that are, are, are um, re regrettably on the order of the scale of, uh, of, the, of the size of mirrors so that you get multiple distorted distorted pieces of the wavefront arriving on the same mirror. You can correct that now with, um, if you can measure the distortions, um, in the best way of doing that is to, to create an artificial star up there. You excite a sodium layer with a laser, and now you know that you, you had a point source up there, and you can figure out the distortions necessary to a mirror, bring that, bring that um, artificial star back into a clean focus, and you will also then correct for the same distortions that the light from the star passed through. You'll hear more about I don't know, maybe you did already. Did you, did, you, did you hear the talk about? Okay, I'll go quick. Fabulous imagery. I'll just go very fast. But taxonomy, astronomical imaging systems. Types of radiation, radio, infrared, visible, UV, X-ray, gamma ray. There's all those ranges are covered through, um, there's gamma ray astronomy, um, X-ray astronomy, radio, infrared, the whole range. Properties being imaged is spectral properties and the emission, the, the um, essentially the, the brightness of the, um, or the, at least the magnitude of the star. Mechanism is usually reflection, reflect, refraction or reflection for conventional telescopes, um, but there are, there are interferometers that are used for extremely high re angular resolution measurements where 
the first systems are now coming online um, that, for example, there's one on Mount Wilson um, outside LA. Um, we can actually measure the shape of a star. Is the star round? Is it distorted? Is it oblong? Um, can you, you can separate um, clo very close binary companions and do all kinds of interesting things. Um, and of course, the big, the big um, objective is, it used to be the, to find an exoplanet. I think all of you know is now there's thousands of exoplanets. At this point. In fact, I've been told that the discovery of a new exoplanet doesn't even get you a poster at a meeting anymore. <laughs> it's got to be Earth-like. Then you've got to you talk. Yes. Direct versus indirect. So it's direct for conventional telescopes, image-forming systems in a telescope, although most telescopes don't actually form an image anywhere that anyone looks at. Um, it's indirect for radio telescopes and interferometers. Passive versus active, usually passive, right? Um, laser guide stars adds an active component, so it's a hybrid system in there. Medical imaging, what I will tell you about medical imaging in this last few minutes is that medical imaging has, um, has, um, has spawned a revolution that really started in, um, in the late 1970s. Um, it, seems really, it seems really, really recent to me. <laughs> And for you guys, it seems like, wow, that's way before I was born. Uh, um, but 1976 was the, the year I started high school, was the year that the first, um, the first um, three-dimensional X-ray CT scanner came to Tucson and was available. For every time, every, before that, getting an X-ray meant getting a planar X-ray. And it took a phenomenally skilled radiologist to be able to figure out that through that projected body mass that you had appendicitis looking through. They learned to read these subtle little shadows and other features and, and in the, mentally from, from studying many, many, many example cases um, to, to interpret these incredibly subtle features and make um, internal diagnosis. Now you can get a complete 3D picture of what's going on inside you with a variety of tomographic imaging techniques. We do a lot of research in tomography. Tom what is tomography? The tomography is a collection of a set of data that is in generally 2D data externally that you then reprocess to build a 3D image of what's going on inside the body. This has implications that uh, are really hard to imagine. So what, what did you do if you couldn't, the radiologist couldn't make the determination from the planar x-ray in 1974? Standard of care was exploratory surgery. It's a concept right now. So you went in for a surgical procedure where there was no defined purpose other than to open up and poke around and the surgeon would see could he see something. It sounds so crude by today's standards and yet it was absolutely piece of modern medical um, treatments. Um, what has occurred in, uh, with the development of the, these uh, non-invasive and minimally invasive imaging techniques is a complete revolution that has had a huge impact on the quality of, um, of human life. Modern cone beam X-ray CT systems can get in and see um, incredible detail. Uh, this is um, 100, roughly 100, 130 micron voxel sizes. This is the trabecular bone structures inside. You can watch and make determinations about what's the calcium content in bone. <laughs> you can, you can. Um, well, I won't even bother to go through all the the um, medical imaging procedures. Um, but one of the key aspects about, um, about the use of CT, X-ray CT, is you don't get the signal for free. You have to put X-rays in. Some of the X-rays have to be absorbed. That's the origin of the contrast mechanism. Some make it through. But the ones that get absorbed, um, which are actually the ones that are contributing um, in, to the contrast in the signal, they are delivering dose also into the body. So the big push right now in reducing the amount of, number of X-rays required to be able to form and maintain the same diagnostically valuable um, images in the system. And tomographic systems, humans like looking at, uh, well, we actually almost have to. Three-dimensional pictures, 3, 3D imagery is a little bit, um, 3D imagery is a little bit of a deceptive um, idea. Because if you think about it, so when I look out at you, I'm, I'm rendering a 3D scene in my eye, but what I'm, all I'm really seeing is a bunch of surfaces, right? I don't get to see your... So tomography from medical imaging, we're not content to see just the surface. We want to see the depth through your tissue as well, right? All the brain segments. So the radiologist, when he looks at 3D images, they don't really like 3D renderings. The scientists like 3D renderings because they look cool when you spin them. 
Um, but the radiologist looks through sl a slice at a time, right? Tomography is slice imaging, and that's the way they're still read. And a, and a radiologist may have to read 10,000 slices during a day that he has to scan through, looking slice by slice, um, you know, and making a call of um, health or disease and, or what the condition is. A um, lot of work in developing modern systems. They have achieved um, a very great state of performance. Um, but there's a long way to go, and a big power in, in a, a big piece of the puzzle of what the image science can bring is uh, additional computational power, computers to do a second look at the image, see if there's something that the radiologist overlooked, systems that adapt to things it finds in the image to get a finer look, this, this length scale question. Okay, so the, if, the, if, the, if the system itself sees an anomaly in the body, how about it zooms in and gets additional higher resolution detail on that to allow the diagnosis? It's too late. The radiologist reads the image two hours after the data was taken. It's too late then to go back and, and zoom in and get an additional data. Spect, modern PET and SPECT systems are in use for um, everything from um, assessing, does the heart get sufficient blood supply? If not, which arteries are clogged? Are there, you know, scanning for tumors? Characterizing tumors, how metabolically active is it? Uh, what is the likelihood it's, it has metastasized? Uh, what is the region that a volume, that a, of um, tissue that a surgeon would need to resect? Is a, is a chemotherapy or a targeted immunotherapy being effective? Is the tumor shrinking? Is it there's a zillion questions that are answered now with the modern biomedical imaging methods. But let's finish up the last couple of minutes with a question about image science. What is a science? So here's the piece that makes it a quantitative um, a science, and this is the key things that holds together our image science program here at the University of Arizona. So the first of all, to have, an, to have a science, you've got to have a, longer, uh, a common language, an agreed upon set of definitions. You don't allow everybody to make up their own definitions for words, techniques, and concepts. We all have to agree on the same language. We have to have an accepted set of experimental procedures. You don't get to go out and um, you can enhance, you can add experimental procedures, but they have to be, to be accepted means that they have to survive the test of, of peer review, they have to be reproducible, et cetera. And you have to have a theory with predictive values. And the theory, scientific theories are quantitative, they're testable, and they're falsifiable, right? So the hypothesis, you must, you must be able to propose a hypothesis and either, uh, and be able to falsify it. Very hard sometimes to prove hypotheses true, very easy to prove, to show them false, right? Find one counterexample and you've shown that the hypothesis is false. Um, to prove that a hypothesis or a theory is true is a long process of accumulating additional experimental results um, that are in agreement with the theory or at least don't oppose it. <coughs> they can be modified, they can be falsified, hard to prove true, but that, so that's the nature of uh, building a self-consistent scientific theory is is you, you, you build that and you have things that support it um, and you're building up a body of theories. So is there a theory with predictive value in image science? And the answer is yes, if the goal is to predict the image. We have theories of propagation of radiation, theories of radiation detection. But is it so obvious if the goal is to predict the quality of the image? And this is one of the areas that the, the U of A has been particularly active in, is in the question about how you define the image quality. How do you define the measure and, pre and um, predict the image quality of a system? How well can the image be used for, um, to do something? And that is really the key. This was formulated by Charles Metz, um, a um, researcher at the University of Chicago, who recognized that in order for imaging to be a science, you have to have a quantitative measure of the success of the image. And it has to be defined in terms of the ability of an observer to extract information from the image. So the image is not, uh, the, the, whether it's pleasant or we find the noise characteristics uh, pleasing to the eye isn't the answer. You mu it's, the question is, can you do the task that you acquired the image for? And how well can you do it? And how, how reliable are the numbers you extract? What are the, what are the um, what is it we talk a lot about um, variance? What is, the, um, what is the precision and what is the accuracy of the, of the system to extract information content? This was further formulated by um, Robert Wagner, um, who really was one of the ones who said, um, who identified what a big challenge this has been. Um, this was the, um, 
really reflecting the fact that, you know, so there was image, image science started, and then in 1974, Dainty, and in 2004, Barrett and Myers. Um, it was a long time before there was broad acceptance of this idea that task performance is the only way to, um, to define a quality to, um, to an image. But the good news is task performance is something that is nicely quantifiable. So here's the key elements that form a scientific theory, the question of, of the image science theory. You have to be able to identify what is the information that's desired from the image, how will you, be ext how will you extract it, whether it's a human observer or, in, in most cases, a, a, a mathematical or computerized uh, observer. What is the object will of the image? What is the range of variability within the objects? And what is it that's limiting the information extraction? What is the key? Is it the number of photons you're able to collect? Is it the... Uh, is it the blur or aberrations or, or um, imperfections in the system? Is it the fundamental underlying variability in the nature of the object? So there's the key aspects. You need a task, an observer, object statistics, and image statistics. And all components of these are, are, um, are areas of, um, of building a, and, and furthering the theory of, um, of image science. And here's kind of a picture of of where we're working. I won't, I'm going to finish up on time, so I'm just going to say that we're in the midst of a refinement stage, modify system. We're in the midst of a circle of a, an optimization circle where we have started with the first generation of medical imaging systems, assessed performance via psychophysical studies, that is, how well does a human observer do? We have done computerized studies, calculated figures of merits, modified the system improve the resolution, improve the sensitivity, add additional contrast methods, and this is um, sort of um, the path that, um, that formalizes the development path. Um, probably the biggest thing that's ahead in image science is growing out of um, the growth in computational power. So we are one of the few uh, fields that regularly say, go kids, more video games, right? Because Image science has, it's, it's impossible to exaggerate how much it has benefited from the development of GPUs, right? Accurate scene rendering with, uh, with as much optics in it as possible uh, means that the core of GPUs are, are just absolutely perfect for, um, for building systems that do things like tomographic reconstructions, forward model simulations, uh, and build in um, the optics in, in, in scientific systems. So most of the students in our group, in fact, well, I would almost say all of the students in our group are actually developing um, GPU programming skills as, during the first couple of years of their graduate careers. Uh, it's not that hard. It's an interesting, uh, take, makes you think a little bit differently about how you write um, codes, um, but, but the, um, the things you can do are remarkable. That is, in fact, the last slide. I have, um, I have one quick thing to do. That, um, that I will finish up with, and then I'm more or less exactly on time. Let's see if this runs properly. So I have a, um, I have a little uh, demo here I thought I'd run for you that answers the question. We spent a lot of time asking, um, so an image has information, right? We all agree on that. The information arrives one photon at a time when we're acquiring the image. So we might ask, the, and it's the ensemble of photons that, that carry the information, and so every photon must carry some tiny bit of information, right? And it depends on the task. I've already told you that. So let's see if I can get this to run here. Um, I'm violating a physical law here that says never demo anything, right, live. <laughs> so a little MATLAB script. And I'm going to, um, we're going to build an image. <laughs> photon by photon. I left the I left the um, the name long for the function, um, so you'd see what it, what I'm doing. Okay, so I got an image. So I'm going to start this running. I'm going to stop it when you when you can first the first person who says I think I know what the object is. Okay, so I'll let it run. And it's going to run pretty quickly here. Let's see how we do. Anybody have a well? It's fast, right? So I'm at, we're at, uh, at about 25,000 uh, photons, um, we can identify the images as Einstein. Okay, at about 10,000 photons, we can say that it's an image of a human. It's actually pretty remarkable. Now, 
I'm envisioning an imaging system that, record, that can photon count, right? We do that in gamma ray and x-ray domain all the time. And so is the image quality good? I would ask the question here. Well, the mo right now, when you, you could all say Einstein, it must have been good, right? Now, it turns out I tried a bunch of different faces. There are very few faces that you can, you know, there's something about Einstein's face. We're like, we're all tuned to it. I tried some, you know, as a matter of fact, some people said, try some, try some uh, pop culture faces. And, and I said, okay, I'll do a couple. Now, it took a lot more photons to recognize them. Um, Einstein is interesting. But in this question, as this continues to run, I'm going to ask you the question, did Einstein cut himself shaving this morning? And now you go, image quality is not there yet, right? So the task... And maybe at the end you'll be able to say, well, he didn't cut himself shaving, but I did put a Band-Aid on his face. And you couldn't see it at first because the contrast is down and the resolution is down. But if the question was, is this, for example, the original photograph, or is it one that I've doctored up by putting a Band-Aid on his forehead, you're probably just about starting to tell that there's a Band-Aid on his forehead. So I'm driving home the idea that... Um, that depending on the task, the, you cannot define the image quality on the basis of whether you are able to do without defining what the task is. Was an image of a human? Don't need many photons. Image of a particular human? In Einstein's case, didn't need that many photons. Does he have a blemish? You need a lot of photons. So image quality, um, the, again, depends on the task. Now I think maybe you can start to see the Band-Aid up here. Anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't go too far over. Um, Yeah, so there's, a, there's an inter interferometric. So you're bouncing back and you do a, you do a detection with uh, a phase-sensitive detection, um, which actually gets, the, the longer the wavelength gets, the easier it gets. In fact, I made a visit to, um, not so long ago, to the VLA out, in, um, out on the plains of St. Augustine out in New Mexico. And um, at, the wa at the wavelength domains they work out, this has, what is it, 21 telescopes out on these seven arms that go out. Um, they actually, when the wavelength gets long enough, the frequency um, low enough, you can digitize the waves directly. So they actually digitize not the, not the, uh, not the field squared. They did, did it with an antenna. You detect field. They digitize the val amplitude of the field directly. And then they can afterwards do digital interferometry with all these 21 separate digitized oscillating fields. It's quite remarkable. Yeah. You were talking about the needing to have the, the range of magnification like yes. the mosquito. It, it's, it's not, there's so much of a push for that in astronomical imaging. It's everywhere. It's in biological systems. It's in astronomical systems. It's everywhere you look, you start to realize that the full answer to many scientific problems requires information at a range of length scales that can be many orders of magnitude in, in scale size. Is that like a component of modern telescope design? Is being able to change the field? Of well, so for example, the Large Synoptic um, Survey Telescope wants very precise imagery over the entire sky, and the only the only solution to that was to build an imaging system with a massive focal plane and an optical system that you know captures it some cr crazy large fraction of the um, of the night sky. Yeah. How much does it depend on how much the emitter or detector is moving in relation to the image? Like if the jet, like say you have a jet and you're running your synthetic aperture radar and you only run it for like one meter of flight versus like, you know, several miles of flight, how much does that depend on, like how much does that affect the image resolution? Oh, it has a huge impact. In fact, okay. Yes. 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 That's the key. Okay, well, we'll take a coffee break. We'll continue discussions with ours, and we'll be back here at 10.20. Uh,